But tonight we are here to recognize my colleague and my friend, Dr. Devin Zuber, GTU Associate Professor of American Studies, Religion and Literature, affiliated with the Center for Swedenborgian Studies. Dr. Zuber also serves as chair of the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies of Religion. Dr. Zuber received his PhD in English Literature in 2010 from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Since then, he has held fellowships and residencies at multiple prestigious institutions, including the Department of Aesthetics and Culture at Stockholm University, the Rachel Carson Center for the Environment at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and at the former Igman, Igman Bergman, sorry, Igmar Bergman Estate on Faro Island, Sweden. Dr. Zuber will be visiting Professor of Religion and Literature at Humboldt University of Berlin in spring 2022. Several of Dr. Zuber's current projects are in collaboration with performance artist Marina Abramovich, exploring the spiritual qualities of her work. With GTU colleague Dr. Thomas Katoy, Dr. Zuber is working on a book entitled Performing Transcendence, Marina Abramovich and Religion. Dr. Zuber is also working on a compilation of interviews related to an upcoming Abramovich performance to take place at the Royal Academy in London. Dr. Zuber's prize-winning book, A Language of Things, Emanuel Swedenborg and the American Environmental Imagination was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2019. To describe the book, I'll quote Dr. Judith Burling, one of the deans on the selection committee who also holds the title of GTU Professor Emerita of Chinese and Comparative Religions. Dr. Burling said, a language of things is an interdisciplinary tour de force, interweaving art, literature, science, and intellectual history to shed light on a little known strand of the American environmental imagination. At a time when we are questioning the adequacy of dominant historical narratives, Zuber demonstrates how the thought and imagination of Emanuel Swedenborg, often considered a non-mainstream figure, influenced and interacted with many threads of European and American intellectual history. He reminds us that there are nuances and strands of history, alternative narratives that can enhance our ability to see our present and imagine our future. Tonight, we had planned for Dr. Zuber to be in conversation with two illustrious interlocutors, and that is still the case. However, I'm sorry to say that Dr. Timothy Morton, Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University, was unable to join us at the last minute. But to our rescue comes Dr. Zuber's dissertation advisor, Dr. Joan Richardson, Richardson distinguished professor in English, comparative literature, and American studies at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Dr. Richardson has written extensively on poet Wallace Stevens and published several important books on pragmatism. In line with her interest in philosophy, natural history, and science, Dr. Richardson's current work is a spiritual autobiography entitled Images, Shadows of Divine Things. And we are lighted, delighted to welcome Dr. Nicholas Larquier, who is the Sydney and Margaret Anker Professor of German and Comparative Literature at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Larguet's work is broad ranging, including medieval literature, the history of the senses and the production of sense experience, and the history of imagination and the emotions. His current projects are about imagination, figuration, and notions of possibility, and a book on the history of practices and the poetics of prayer. Finally, I'm so pleased to turn things over to moderator, Dr. Rita Shermo, who is the director of the GTU Center for Dharma Studies and co-creator along with Dr. Zuber of the Sustainability 360 Initiative, an incubator for cutting edge research and projects that operate at the intersection of sustainability studies and religion within pluralist, multi-religious and intersectional contexts. Dr. Sherma and Dr. Zuber discussed this work in a newly released GTUX original, Greening Spirituality. Please see the GTU website for information on how to access this new video series. So, Dr. Sherma. Thank you very much, Dr. Pena. Uh, it is a, an honor and a pleasure to be here on this uh, wonderful occasion. 
And I want to congratulate my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Devin Silver, for this remarkable book. Um, I will just read to you very briefly one small um, but important um, note from uh, one of his endorsements. And he has received many. Um, and it's, the endorsement is actually from uh, Reverend Nate Klug. And he says, in a language of things, Devin Zuber offers a critical attempt to restore the fundamental role that religious experience could play in shaping 19th century American approaches to natural space by tracing the ways that Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Muir, and others variously responded to Swedenborg. Zuber illuminates the complex dynamic that came to unfold between the religious, the literary, and the ecological. A language of things situates this dynamic within some of the new materialisms of recent environmental thought, showing how these earlier authors anticipate present concerns with the other than human in the Anthropocene. I welcome Dr. Zuber now. Devin, you have the floor. Thanks, Rita. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. I know especially for you East Coasters or beyond, it's late after a long day of Zooming and meetings. So I am very humbled by your presence here tonight. And I'm very grateful for Nicolas Larger and Joan Richardson that they are here to be in dialogue with me about the project in various ways to one degree or another. Uh, this book comes out of conversations that I had with Joan when I was in graduate school that led me down the rabbit hole of pursuing Swedenborg's diffuse presence in 19th century American culture. Or even though I didn't yet know Niklaus, I was aware of his work on uh, mysticism and the place of mysticism in aesthetic experience that was um, very important in the final stages of writing that project. So it feels like a full circle is being able to be drawn by having those two particular people here tonight. So I'm gonna say a, a few words I've prepared uh, with some images to sort of set the stage. I'll talk for maybe 15 minutes, uh, hopefully not much longer, and then we'll turn over to um, Niklaus and then Joan to offer some responses, and then we'll have a larger, more plenary forum, which my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Rita Sharma, will be facilitating. So let me go to share screen. I really hate Zoom, but the good thing about it is that I can um, be in dialogue with people all over. Thanks for being here, and let me just uh, go here. Okay, hopefully all of you can see this. For those of you who are from the Bay Area or know Northern California, the image on the cover of this book is of the San Francisco Bay, which is a sheer coincidence. It's what the designers of the book chose. It's Mount Tamalpais across the bay. So it's Earth Day, of course, a token day of appreciation to our swiftly tilting planet, a holiday whose inception is caught up in the effective response to the image of the blue marble earth that circulated in 1972 and became instrumental and iconic for environmental justice struggles in the 1970s. Earth Day is thus a kind of art day where we can recall the ability of the aesthetic to augment broader public conversations and the political to offer new ways of imagining the world and our place in it. But not to view this world with rose-colored glasses in 2021. Let's be honest about where we stand some 51 years after the first Earth Day was commemorated. Here in California today, Governor Gavin Newsom announced the declaration of major drought emergencies in counties across the state, including Sonoma, just north of me here in Berkeley, which is unprecedented in year after year of amplifying wildfire effects caused by climate change. We overstate the word historic, Newsom said today at a press conference, but this is indeed a historic moment. 
Yet the unprecedented has become almost commonplace to anyone who has lived through the past few years here. From 2018's lethal wildfires in paradise to that strangest of days only last year when the dome of wildfire smoke was so thick above the bay that it turned San Francisco into an orange hazy simulacrum of the Blade Runner film franchise. This is not my picture, this is grabbed from Google. It's so apocalyptic, everyone seemed to say on that day, if you were in the Bay, and the commonplaceness of that expression underscored the persistent ways we continue to cast environmental and planetary collapse in explicitly theological terms, even in the most secular of contexts. This is perhaps the most acute hubris of the Anthropocene, if that is the term we want to use to describe our new man-made geological era we are cascading the planet into. Apocalypse, in its etymological and religious roots, of course, is not so much the penultimate end times, but the revelation of things as they are, the uncovering, a revelatory revealing of things as they actually are. So much of our contemporary environmental rhetoric remains committed to this kind of apocalyptics, a scientific info dump of data that we bury our heads in the sand to avoid cognizing and confronting. Rising water levels, shrinking glaciers, increased temperatures, deforestation, the sixth great extinction of, a, of species, so on and so forth. We all have our own litanies of facts and figures to recite when we think of this. We must not flinch away from the ethics of seeing what our species has done and is continuing to wreak on the planet in the name of development and free markets and progress. But is tallying all this information enough? The fact that 51 years after Earth Day's inception, that we are planetarily worse off in many ways than we were decades ago, should signal an attenuation of the efficacy of all this data on its own to augment and change opinion and the public sphere. We have continued under a kind of delusion that all we have needed is more rational inputs, the amplification of more scary facts to jolt collective common sense into action. In this public sphere of opinions and legal regimes since the Enlightenment, religion has tended to be sidelined in the conversation, privatized and interiorized, or allowed to engage only under certain constraints, that it be well-behaved, reasonable, not overly emotional, and function as a force of disciplinary self-regulation. 